Hey everyone, just wanted to share a little something here I came across the other day. I just uh, moved recently and found this issue of National Geographic from July 2013 in a bottom of a box somewhere, so I started flipping through it, and oh, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> so this is titled Our Wild Wild Solar System. And the article I was looking at is called, It All Began in Chaos. And it's talking about this whole theory of the late heavy bombardment. So I just thought I'd read a little section here. This is kind of interesting. It says... Scientists have long known that the planets, comets, and other bodies orbiting the sun were born, some 4.5 billion years ago, from a spinning dis disk of dust and gas called the solar nebula. They've long assumed that things formed more or less where they orbit now. In the frigid realm beyond Neptune, the material available for making comets would have been a mix of ice and fluffy car carbon-rich dust. But Inti's dark grains contained exotic minerals, hardy bits of rock and metal such as tungsten and titanium nitride that could only have been forged near the newborn sun, as temperatures of more than 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Some violent process must, must have hurled them into the outer solar system. We were dumbfounded, says Donald Brownlee, head of the Stardust team and, jo and, jo and Joswiak's boss. It was astounding to find these highest temperature materials in the solar system's coldest bodies. The solar system was liter literally turning itself out. When most of us were growing up, the solar system seemed reliable and well-behaved. There were nine planets orbiting in a well-determined orbits like clockwork, forever, says Renu Melhothra of the University of Arizona. Forever in the past and forever in the future. Planetarium displays and the lovely mechanical devices called orreries embodied this idea, which went back to Isaac Newton. In the late 17th century, Newton showed that a planet's orbit could be calculated from its gravitational interaction with the sun. Soon, clock clockmakers were building increasingly elaborate orreries with brass planets that circled the sun on unchanging pathways. Newton himself knew the reality was messier. The planets, he recognized, must also interact with one another. Their gravitational tuggings are far weaker than those of the sun. But over time, they affect the path of their neighbors. As a result, as Brownlee puts it, there's no such thing as a circular orbit. In principle, the relentless pull of gravity can amplify these small deviations until orbits migrate, cross, or otherwise go haywire. Newton concluded that God must step in from time to time to fix the clockwork. But he couldn't say when. Even, even he who invented calculus was defeated by the n-body problem. He had no formula for calculating into the distant future the orbits of multiple bodies that were all pulling on one another. In practice, no one saw evidence that planetary orbits had ever changed, so the clockwork solar system stuck with us, enduringly stable, it seemed, even without fixes from the Creator. But a far more dramatic view has arisen in the past decade or so. While the findings from Stardust indicate the solar system was turned inside out during infancy, many scientists now think it also went through a raucous adolescence. Hundreds of millions of years after they formed, the biggest planets swept into new orbits, casting large rocks and comets every which way. In this view, the scarred surface of the moon is a lingering testimony to a period of epic mayhem. Who would have thought that the giant planets might move, that the entire layout of the solar system could change, said Alan Stern of the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado. Some signs were there, Stern says, but it took new, t it took new telescope surveys to, to reveal them, along with digital oraries, clever algorithms that apply brute computing power to calculating, calculating the past and future orbits of the planets. The first clue came from Pluto, the oddball of the solar system. It dips far above and below the pancake-like plane in which the eight planets travel. It swoops on an elongated orbit that takes it from 30 to 50 times Earth's distance from the Sun. But the most curious thing about Pluto is its bond with Neptune. 
It's called a resonance. For every three times that Newt Neptune orbits the sun, Pluto orbits twice, and in such a way that bodies never approach each other. Then I'll skip ahead here. Meanwhile, astronomers had started just to discover planets around other stars, and to radically expand their notions of what's possible in a planetary system. Hundreds of ex extrasolar planets have now been detected. That goes back to the Kepler thing. Some are in tightly bunched orbits, much closer together than the planets in our solar system. Some are Jupiter and Neptune-sized worlds that race on insanely hot orbits close to their suns. Others loop deep into space on weird trajectories. On average, the orbits of extrasolar planets are more eccentric than those in our solar system. Some planets even float, f float freely in interstellar space. None of this is what you would expect from planets that were born in a spinning disk around a star and stayed quietly in their birthplace. That process should produce well-spaced, near-circular orbits, like the ones in the brass orreries. Clearly, many planets had migrated, but smooth migrations didn't seem to account for extreme orbits and late bombardments, at least not to Levison. He began to suspect that our solar system's history had been anything but smooth, that it had somehow endured a global gravitational instability, as he now calls it. So there's an orrery. So it just goes on and on to talk about the whole end body problem and this whole idea that the gravitational pulls of the different planets went through this uh, this whole evolution basically. At one point it all went through a very dr dramatic change and the bigger planets basically threw a bunch of comets and asteroids all over the solar system and that's what created all the craters on the moon on the Earth's moon and other moons and uh, yeah I could go on and on but uh, the whole point of this is that it's just another perfect example of how if you just take an honest look at it the entire gravitational model absolutely is interwoven with evolutionary theory and when you trying to separate them is just a virtually impossible task and that you know obviously Newton seemed to try and bridge that gap and you know account for the end body problem by just saying that God must step in but you know he's kind of he's already revealing the the disconnect there and that's the disconnect that continues to this very day where you know we have you know most mainstream creation scientists who completely reject evolutionary theory and reject the big bang but are absolutely um, dedicated to the entire gravitational model of the universe but you know have this sort of schizophrenic approach to you know, well, these when you when you read through this and you read through all these astronomers, these are the guys that are telling us uh, the sizes and the shapes and the makeup of all the planets and stars, and are calculating their gravitational, uh, you know, the, the gravitational pull on, from the sun and on each other, and you know now they're actually trying to solve this end body problem using you know computers, which can calculate things, you know, supposedly uh, you know that human beings can't. And um, they're trying to put the whole model together, right? Um, but it's all about change. It's all about evolution. They never stay the same. The, the, the gravitational pulls of, of all these planets and interstellar bodies and stars, you know, they're constantly pulling on each other. And it just, you cannot read any of this material. And it, it's all about evolution. It all requires millions of years to form and change, and, and that's the whole point of it. And this is what I think if we're going to be serious about, you know, I've seen people recently talking about tr trying to get a debate with Kent Hovind, uh, you know, propaganda destroyer uh, was suggesting Rob Skiba do a, a debate with Kent Hovind, not that I'd 
really would expect Hoven to uh, to accept that debate. He just seems content to just belittle it. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but you know, at some point somebody is going to somebody somebody from the the creationist camp is is going to step into the ring, and when when that happens, from where I stand, this. This is the point that absolutely has to be focused on is the absolute symbiotic relationship between just the just the the gravitational theory as a whole what they claim is scientific fact and you know cosmic evolution big bang cosmology I mean they they go hand in glove you cannot you really cannot separate them and uh for how many years now have um, you know biblical creationists been in this just bizarre in this bizarre position of rejecting everything that these scientists say about evolution, but then accepting everything they say about um, you know these these gravitational the gravitational theory and and how it, it it's responsible for all these orbits and rotations and everything. And it's, you know, you're, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. They're, there's, they're, com- they're completely inseparable. And so this is why, for me, this is one of the biggest reasons why the whole flat earth uh, issue does have so much relevance, you know, aside from all the, New World Order conspiracy kinds of things about what they're hiding in the Antarctic or the North Pole or, you know, the the firmament and everything. It's if just the, the issue of evolution as a whole requires a Big Bang cosmology. And, you know, I challenge anyone to, you know, as you're just kind of cruising through life and you come across things like, you know, old National Geographic, or you're watching stuff on television. I know that there's lots of other people out there who, now that you're in this new paradigm, you know, this considering an enclosed cosmology, as the Bible seems to, you know, pretty straightforwardly describe, you know, I I don't know how other people don't just see this, this blatant relationship between Newtonian physics and you know this the the gravitational model and cosmic evolution. I mean, you, I mean, it's just it's it's intertwined with everything everything that they they propose about how stars are formed, how you know planets are formed. This is supposedly how the moon was born, you know, and it's it's all completely and utterly reliant upon their gravitational model, which. You know, as we know, it's just been. They've already they've already admitted that it doesn't even bore out bore itself out with their own math because then they have to inject. You know, dark matter and dark energy into the equation, which is just you know, it's a complete fudge factor. It's it's a cheat, and uh, and they do that, and nobody even blinks an eye, and we just keep listening to to mainstream scientism. Um, completely oblivious to the, the contradictory nature of accepting what on the one hand is a, is a thoroughly evolutionary principle this, these these foundational pieces to the, to the evolutionary uh, theory and yet we try and then inject them back into biblical creation we try and lay, lay that down as a groundwork and, and to assume that, that such a thing like gravity can't be questioned when from beginning to end, it's you can't divorce it from evolution, and this is something that you know I just want to continue to urge people to to investigate and research and be able to demonstrate.